Wednesday was the second of a three-day general strike in the southern region of Arequipa against the mining project of Transnational Southern Copper Corporation. The project is planned to take place in the fertile valley of Tambo in the province of Islay in the west of the region. The Transnational is the third largest copper producer in the world. University students in the capital of Arequipa joined the strike and explained why they mistrust the Southern Copper Corporation. The students are conscious that the only thing the mining company wants is to take away the resources of our country. It does not care if in the process it destroys the valley. It doesn't care if it destroys the agriculture, and it doesn't care if it smothers the life of those in the province. That is why we are here protesting so there are not any more deaths. Congressman Justiniano Apasa from Arequipa argues that the track record of the company contaminating other regions such as Ilo, Moquegua and Tacna has convinced the great majority of locals that the project should not continue. He also explains that the mistrust of the people extends to the president who changed his stance on the project after elections. We denounce as representatives of the region that the state is acting as the negotiator for Southern Copper. The company no longer shows its face and it has disappeared from the scene. This is happening when the government should be the one who ensures the health of its people, not the company, because the people have chosen the government so that it can defend and represent them. Violent confrontations are likely to continue in the coming days, with the government set on pushing the project forward and most local media blaming the executive for not being able to convince the people of Arequipa. Rael Mora, Telesur, Lima. In improvised plastic tents, over 30 families from the Pacific region are taking refuge in Bogota. Among them is Angela, a mother of five who fled from violence in her hometown, but ironically found more of the same when she arrived in Bogota. Another armed group showed up saying that they didn't want to see any black people there, and the next black person they see, they would kill. So we also had to flee that place. The recently approved National Development Plan has opened up the possibility that state-owned lands get assigned for big-scale projects instead of being restituted to the victims of conflict such as Angela. I feel discriminated against, neglected, and I beg for compassion and help as we are not here because we want to be. We are here because they have been removing us from our lands. While land distribution has been at the very core of Colombia's armed conflict, the latest development plan has been widely criticized as far as it will deepen land concentration in favor of big private players. When many families attempted to return, their land was already being used for big-scale projects. That shows that this war is against civilian populations. It aims to displace us from our territories, and to take our land, and to give it to the multinationals. The new development plan has even reduced the approval time for mining and oil companies applying for government licenses, a move that has been seen as a way to continue to expand privileges for the big scale companies at the expense of rural economy. A state that gives away our country should make the Colombian people stand up with dignity and demand deep reforms. We must protest against this development plan and the looting of Colombia by the multinationals. For almost three months, 39 families displaced from the Colombian Pacific have been living under these conditions, hoping that someday they will be able to return to their lands. Natalia Margarita, Telesur, Bogotá. Teaching marimbas and conunos, Lindbergh Valencia shares with the public the distinct musical styles and instruments utilized by musicians of African descent across Ecuador. A visible population on the coast and throughout the country, there are over one million Ecuadorian citizens who identify themselves as being of African descent. Music is life for us. There is not an activity that people of African descent undertake that is not intrinsically connected with music. Valencia said that in recent years, there have been positive strides to further the rights of Afro-Ecuadorians. The 2008 Constitution of Monte Cristi declared Ecuador a plurinational and multicultural state, giving greater protection to Afro-Ecuadorian, indigenous, and Montuvio populations. Shortly thereafter, Presidential Decree 60 was issued, which recognizes the historical injustices and racism present in society against Afro-Ecuadorians and how this has affected their access to basic services. 
We have the Constitution, the decree which has the national plan for the elimination of racial discrimination. We have health, education, employment. There are many things which have been done, and now we need to carry out these plans. The International Decade for People of African Descent, put forward by the United Nations, seeks to bring the struggles of people of African descent worldwide into the spotlight and has vowed to work to develop national and international legal frameworks to better protect their rights. Gongorda Farias said that in his province of Esmeraldas, fishing is a major economic activity of the population and that the destruction of the coastline due to the onslaught of commercial shrimp farms has affected their livelihoods. The places where we live all over the country are the poorest, historically speaking. Nature has been destroyed and this has forced many of us to migrate to other cities. So today there is a recognition of this and we hope that they take advantage of this decade and implement policies that benefit our people. To meet the objectives of the International Decade, the headquarters of the Union of South American Nations has developed a permanent working group, which serves as a space for reflection to keep the concerns of this population at the forefront, as well as create awareness of the vast cultural and economic contributions of Afro-Ecuadorians to society. Liz Sherfias, Delisor, Ecuador. The Honduran Libre Party has called for a demonstration in front of the National Congress after the local media reported that the Social Security Institute had written checks to the ruling National Party for more than $100 million. This comes on top of last year a commission proved that under former President Porfirio Lobo, the institute was invested by its directors for more than $350 million. We show our solidarity to men and women that are looking for health in many places. But we also want to say to the National Party and to President Juan Orlando, don't be fooled. The people will not go down without a fight, and we are ready to go out to the streets. We're ready to face them. The Honduran Social Security Institute is in crisis with no medicine, and more than 40% of the scheduled operations delayed due to the lack of equipment. Former President Manuel Zelaya, leader of the political opposition, called for permanent actions demanding the resignation of President Juan Orlando Hernández, who hasn't been able to discredit the checks presented as proof and that many point out were used in his presidential campaign in 2013. Long live the people of Honduras! Let's go demonstrate in every city in Honduras until we take down this government that is unworthy and doesn't represent the people of Honduras. Several protests are expected for this week and the pressure against the government will increase with more proof starting to appear that links the National Party with one of the most scandalous corruption cases in the history of Honduras. Gerardo Torres, Telesur, Central America. In Buenos Aires, the 5th International Political Film Festival is underway with the participation of filmmakers from 34 countries and around 130 movies. The celebration gathers film producers, directors, actors and activists trying to spread the word about several subjects. We understand that we are involved in politics in our day-to-day -day life. We label it as political, but it is cinema, social cinema, fiction cinema, human cinema. We board important subjects as we talk about history, about human trafficking, about environment, the mining industry, stories of activism, historical leaders. Many people attending the festival point out that even sometimes in a tacit way, all films are political. I come here pretty interested because this festival has consolidated. This is a festival that presents many views and maybe on its most attractive elements is the diverse way in which the subject of political cinema is addressed. Not only explicitly political films, but also those with an underlying political content, as it happens in many films. The jury is formed by filmmakers, actors and politicians who put together their own perspectives to evaluate the films, creating a collective and a richer verdict about them. All the productions that question different subjects, ways of life, societies are useful for debating. Some of them aim more directly to create consciousness about some topics, other ones to reflect, other ones to give knowledge. I think these are fundamental for a democratic life.
democrática. This international political film festival tries to show that cinema can be very helpful for spreading political and social struggles. And thus, it can become something much bigger than pure entertainment. Aurelia Ponce, Telesur Buenos Aires.